Welcome to the Book Editor Show number 27. Uh, today we're going to start a series of editing core plots. Up first is Overcoming the Monster. We're, we're going to be taking a look at these um, from uh, Christopher Booker's um, book, <laughs> The Seven Basic Plots. Um, and he goes through several of these, you know, that you just find everywhere. And so we're going to start this one off with Overcoming the Monster. I'm Clark Chamberlain, and I know of no one better to talk about Overcoming the Monster. Bram Stoker used him as the basis in creating Van Helsing. The monster hunter of unedited manuscripts, my friend and co-host Peter Turley. Peter, how are you doing today? I'm awesome. <laughs> We're trudging into the the gothic theme with the uh, the introductions. I like that. Yeah, I thought I was pretty good. So, <laughs> well, and it certainly I thought was fitting, you know, because the uh, you know when you think about monsters, immediately for myself at least, you know, I think of those classic monsters um, from the gothic era, you know, the Draculas, the Frankenstein's. Uh, um, Jekyll and Hyde, you know, all that type of stuff. But um, but it can go much deeper than that, too. You can, yeah. I think uh, it's a great topic. It's going to be a, a good show. I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah. So um, I came across these um, a few months ago, and I've, I, uh, I have not bought the book yet, and I'm going to, um, but it's quite a monster of a book on its own. It's uh, over 700 <laughs> pages, and it has a, it's, it's just really in-depth. Uh, into uh, the basics of you know these stories that we're constantly always retelling and um christopher booker he's put this down into that there's only seven stories now i i think there's some more than that but uh, we're going to cover these seven basic ones that he goes through and and i really liked it because he kind of breaks down each of the stories um in very easy to understand methods now um so for our listeners, what you're going to get out of these next few episodes is you're going to be able to take a look at your book because sometimes you write a book and you're really not sure exactly where it fits. And if you don't know where it fits, it's hard to know how to fix it. And so this will help you take a look and say, oh yeah, I, I this book is definitely about overcoming the monster. I need to make sure that these elements are here. And the reason why we have to add in those certain elements is because we want to have a familiarity when someone sits down to read the book so that they can get into it easier. Yeah, that that familiarity is kind of like, that's why like the three-act structure is so strong, or, you know, like we do things in threes, like, you know, many sayings are like this, that, and the other. <laughs> and um, uh -huh. it, it's because like the brain works in these patterns, doesn't it? We, we, we've grown up with certain patterns, and, you know, obviously the three-act structure is one of them, and, these these plots are just like that. So you know, when the the readers reading a certain story, there's that familiarity to the structure, and it it makes the whole process seem it makes the story seem like it's working like a lot better. Right. <laughs> it's it's easier for them to to enter that virtual reality, that immersion phase of the reading, because um, when people break rules on these types of things, and and we're not saying you can't break rules, but when they do and it's not done right. And that, and it pops someone out of the story, then they're done. And so that's why it's important to have these elements in there. Yeah. And I mean, because, you know, some stories could be, you know, a mixture of a couple of these. Yeah. You know, they could kind of, if you imagine sort of like a Venn diagram kind of slot in the middle as the circles cross over and it could be like a little bit of each. And it just serves as like a guideline or a point of reference, really, to, like you say, to say, has it got this and this and this? Uh huh. And then, and then that way, this can also help with your marketing. You know, if you you're finding, yeah, you know, this is the monster story that also adds in this story. You know, and so you can target the right people to read your book when it's ready to come out. So, um, so let's dive into this. You know, what is it that you need? So first, basically, you know, for overcoming the monster, you're gonna have to have a monster. <laughs> a, a monster. These are the three basic elements. You got a monster, a protagonist, and an hour problem that pulls the protagonist in, and then we'll go through the structure. But let's just start, um, just so you got an idea of, of monster. Um, you know, I already mentioned Dracula, definitely a great monster. But also, you know, you look at uh, some uh, classic sci-fi movies like Star Wars, and that is really overcoming the monster as well because you've got a small group, you know, the rebellion who are overcoming this giant empire. You know, and so that can work as well. Yeah, the mo you know the monsters not always. I know we talk about kind of like Bram Stoker and you know like Dracula and Frankenstein, but also like a lot of them can also serve as maybe a metaphor for like the inner monster, or maybe it's not a metaphor. Maybe it's you know someone battling depression or something like that, and you know it, it can be it can just be like a struggle, like a fierce struggle. You know, it's it, it's mm -hmm. 
typically, obviously, a, a monster <laughs> or a, an antagonist. Um, but obviously, that can come from within as well, and you know, you, you can kind of subvert the the structure that way and and go for something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely one that you could do. Um, like you mentioned with the, um, I mentioned it already. You know that Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde type of thing, and that's um, I always look at that. You know, and and see. Um, in adult mental health today, you know, people who have wild mood swings and, um, well, and the guys who I work with, with PTSD, a lot of times well, myself, you know, I have that level that I get to. And, um, uh, some of my family has been close, you know, they get scared, you know, cause I, I have quite a threshold before I reach that anger level, but when it's gone and I snap and they're like, you're like a different person altogether, you know, and I don't even know who you are. And so that kind of thing, you can really bring that in to the monster, you know, that, that trying to overcome that and be a better person at the end of it all. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about that before, haven't we? How sort of, I can't quite remember which, which show it was, but how, you know, that's part of a, the attraction of stories because we get to see how other people are dealing with situations that we're going through and how we can translate that lesson to our own life. So, you yeah. know, it can, be, it can be powerful stuff to, you know, to, to tackle these themes. Yeah, it can. Um, you know, one of the overcoming monsters I just thought about, uh, I didn't put it in for my notes here, but is Life of Pi. Have you ever read that book? I have, yes. Yeah, I've uh, seen the movie. Yeah, and so that's, by the time you get to the end of it, I don't want to do a spoiler here for you, mm -hmm. but, you know, the end um, really becomes your realization that this was how this person was dealing with what was going on. And um it's a fantastic metaphor story all the way through it, you know, and then overcoming those monsters in there that he has to deal with. Yeah, it's a, it's a real, um, it kind of reminded me, I mean, essentially as a story, you could say that it's nothing like it, <laughs> but it, it, it reminded me a little bit of, you know, like the old man in the sea, Hemingway. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. And, you know, kind of using the, using like nature and the elements and, but also representing like a, someone's inner struggle. Um, and that, those types of stories are just they're just the best, you know. Like they're some of my favorite stories. I think you know, over having to just overcome something, you know, the the odds and adversity. It's a real rich ground to develop character, you know. And that's what we get to the end, and you want to have that kind of that epiphany or that that growth that's taken place. And this is this is a really good plot to to do something like that. Yeah. You can do a lot with this besides just having a fantastic monster hunter story. Um, let's dive into what and they're great too. <laughs> yeah. And are great. So let's dive into the, so, so Booker lays out five steps or five stages here of what's going to happen in the story. Um, and we'll just go through each one of these and then move on to the next one. So the first one is the anticipation stage. And so he's talking about that this is going to hint that there's a monster out there, that there's something going on and that, uh, that, the person, the protagonist needs to prepare themselves to deal with this. Um, trying to think of some good examples. Um, any kind of thing that has training going on in a book, you know, there, where you've got it set up that, um, hey, there's something out here and we need to prepare ourselves for it. That's that's kind of what this anticipation stage is talking about. Yeah, um, I was just kind of having a, a little quick look as you were talking then for some kind of examples. And we've got like... Um, you know, David and Goliath, um, Star Wars, as you said, you know, and yeah, it is that sort of um, something, something bigger than, you know, yourself. But, and yeah. obviously that starts with, um, you know, the reason for the protagonist having to overcome the monster, which as you say, is that, that kind of, that call and that, you know, <laughs> there's got to be a reason that's compelling them to, to go out and, and face that monster. Yeah. It really pulls them into the story, you know, this is definitely one of those that's that can be very plot driven you know that uh that the plot is going to pull them into the story so and we keep mentioning star wars you know so star wars the main thing that, you know the final thing that pulled them in is where for luke is when he sees that his aunt and uncle are dead you know that's 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 crossed him over that line and it's moved him into something um i'm trying to think uh so uh, there's an older movie that i really enjoyed it's a french film called brotherhood of the wolf and um it tells a story that's happening, oh, what, the 1700s, I think is when it's taking place, 1700s or early 1800s. And uh, this town is being plagued by this monster and this monstrous wolf that's going on. And so they uh, they have to bring in someone to take care of it, right? And so 
that's the protagonist. He's brought into the problem because he has the ability to solve it, or or that's what their hope is. That he has the ability to solve it. Um, other ones like that would be like uh, um, the Seven Samurai, uh, which was later done as uh, the Magnificent Seven. And I'm, I'm mentioning movies here because I I think we've probably seen more movies than than maybe have read the same books. So yeah, it's a really popular kind of like movie format, isn't it? Just because. Oh yeah. You know, the, there's that chance for the big battle at the end, uh-huh. <laughs> which you know exactly. visually we all want to see. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, you're going to have this call to action. So that's when you're when you're doing your editing, and you're reading through, taking a look to see: Do you have this call to action in here? Is this anticipation stage in there? Are you hinting, or is the monster right in the face? You know, like uh, like a lot of times we don't have a full understanding of what the monster is yet at this stage. Yeah, so I think in in regard to say if we go back to like Star Wars, you know, it's the the death of his his aunt and uncle, and obviously it's it was the Empire, and you know when he that that scene when he stands out and he looks at the suns, and it's kind of like that's the mo that that's the moment where you know he's going to start moving into the story. Um, yeah, and so there is that can kind of align with the inciting incident, mm-hmm. you know, perhaps that can kind of you know. Two birds, one stone, <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah. But it, it's that it's that kind of thing, isn't it? It's that sort of there's no going back. Yeah, exactly. And then which brings us to the second stage. And they call he calls this, Booker calls this the dream stage. The initial stage where the the protagonist is brushing up with the monster or the agents of the monster and has really good success. You know, uh, so much success that it seems like they're immune to the dangers that are, are really there. Um so, you know, um, let's take a look at Harry Potter, Harry Potter diving into this, this world, you know, um, the very first book, we're getting hints at monsters up front with Voldemort. Um, and then we're getting into the agents of him when, when there's a, the chapter where he deals with the troll and they handle the troll very well, you know, they come out unscathed really from that situation and they definitely feel, um, a lot of inner strength and power at that point. Yeah, it's it's kind of, it's like a mini celebration, like a part mm-hmm. way into the story, isn't it? It's like where, yeah, they, they seem invincible, and you kind of get into you kind of get to rejoice and celebrate in the uh, the fact that it's all going well for now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know, and the uh, Lord of the Rings does this really well. You know, where they're the things are just really great up front and they're going on this fun journey and everything's going to be good <laughs> before it all really turns bad <laughs> real fast. Yeah. I think so. that's up to um, where they sort of, where they leave, is it McGregor? The fart where they leave his field and uh-huh. he sort of says, you know, like this is, it's like the furthest from the shy they've ever, ever been. Yeah. And that's kind of like the, you know, you could, you could almost imagine it like going a little gray from that, from that point, you know, like the, uh-huh. Well, and you know, and then Dyer fades into the distance. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, what is it? Boromir. Boromir is the one who dies, right? Yeah. In the first, you know, with the the initial group of the the fellowship, and he's the oh, first spoiler. one. Spoiler. <laughs> Whoa, sorry. <laughs> In case you uh you've been living under a rock for a lot of decades. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean that that's the same type of thing, you know. It, it felt like this group was going to be unstoppable. And then you get the realization that it's not, which is our next stage, you know, um, which is the frustration stage, the third part. And this is where they can, I have a confrontation with the monster, but failure, but fail to defeat it. You know, they, they have utter failure with this and something really bad happens. So, yeah, usually, um, you know, so an underestimation was, has, has taken place, you know, it's because obviously you have the, the little successes, because if if they weren't succeeding and things bad things were happening at that early stage, we wouldn't really care. You know, we don't we're not connected to the character at that point. Mm-hmm. But by this point, after seeing them have a little success, we are. Um, yeah. And then this is where you really ramp up that monster. You know, it's it's bigger than they thought. It's bigger than you thought. And you know, this is where that comes in. Yeah. Um. So, uh, I t- I've been talking a ton about it. My my two new middle grade books, uh, Hank Hudson book one and two. So book two is definitely about the monster because there's a, there is a monster in the first one, but it's, they don't defeat it. And that like, it's almost the step one here where it's a hint of it, but the book, book two really follows this. And when I was reading, I was like, yeah, you know, I've got all this, you know, like, and we get to this frustration stage where they get beat and they get beat bad, you know, and, um, 
to the point where your protagonist is really deciding, can we even do this? You know, can we move forward um, from this uh, from this defeat? Um, looking at Star Wars, uh, I would think that if we took this point, it would probably be the death of Ben. Although they escape, you know, Ben Kenobi dies. Spoiler alert. He's dead. <laughs> Sorry. No point um, watching now. I know. <laughs> um, so, but he, you know, and Luke is really shook up over that because Luke probably, you know, has seen him as this powerful figure, right? You know, and if, and if Ben can die, you know, what, what chance do they have of being able to do this? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's that initial disappointment, isn't it, where they've, they've put everything into the training and they've gone away and they've trained and they've come back and it's not quite worked out. <laughs> you know, there's still something yeah. missing. There's, there's, there's like, still... oh, I've put all this work in and, you know, it's not it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not enough. And why am I doing this? You know, why? Because your protagonist has really struggled through all this. You know, that training is not – uh, I love training scenes. They're fun that – because it shows how much work that they're putting into it. And it's not an easy thing. You know, if you've got someone who's just, um, if you, if you were to write this with the uh, dream stage taking place with, um, where everything was the dream stage going on from the anticipation and it wasn't difficult, then this stage here, the frustration stage isn't going to mean as much because it seems like, Oh yeah, well they just didn't, they weren't, uh, they didn't anticipate it. But if you have those, if you've shown them that they've worked hard for it, they've had some success and then they don't have the success, then that will help connect people together and flows better. Definitely. And create a little frustration in the reader, which yes. is good. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, and um, I threw a book down. Uh, the, I got about halfway through it, and we still had not ever seen them fail. And um, I was like, "Well, this has become boring." <laughs> so, you definitely want to have that failure taking place because we don't want the story. The stories aren't interesting if there's no drama. If they're not having problems, what's the point of reading the story? Yeah, it would be. It would be like. Um... Like watching Superman, but there was no kryptonite. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be like, oh, yawn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, which this will bring us after the frustration stage, we're, we're brought to our fourth stage, the nightmare stage. And this is the final ordeal uh, death match where only one person can survive. Uh, and it seems inevitable that the monster is going to win. Um, and so this is, you know, we take our Star Wars example. This is the attack on the Death Star and everyone is dying, right? I mean, everyone's getting shot down. Spo sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so there's a good job there's another three films coming out, you know? I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's what, that's what we're talking about here. Um, a Beowulf, uh, or Beowulf, um, when he goes in to attack the monster at the end, you know, you definitely feel like he's still not ready, still doesn't have the ability to do this, to stand up to him yet. Um, and, and that's a good feeling though, you know, because you want them to really big digging deep. You want the, your reader to be on the edge of their seat, wondering if it's going to happen or not. Yeah. Cause we don't want to be sitting back and thinking, Oh, he's got this in the bag. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Cause yeah. that's fun for a little bit, but then you want to take that away. <laughs> You want to sort of build it up and then just deny it, <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. cause even right to the end, you know, you've you, you're at the end of the book, you know. The oh, well, you know, you're not far, and you you get into the big battles, and you think, you know, they've, they've trained and they've failed and they've succeeded, but you still, right to the end, you want to have that that chance of failure and to yeah. really, you know, drag that out. And um, this is where it helps if you have more than just your protagonist, you know, so that you can put more. Um, what you want to up the ante, you want to really make the stakes high here. Um, so 
like if you're George R. R. Martin, this is easy because you kill everybody anyway. So no one, <laughs> <laughs> so that no one goes in thinking, oh no, don't have to worry about that. That's a protagonist. He's going to make it through. <laughs> yeah, um, <plot> armor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but if uh, you know, if you're like everybody else who has a protagonist who will eventually overcome it, <laughs> um, some of the ways to add more of that tension to it at this point, you know, is is seeing other people that are close to the protagonist really getting beat even harder. You know, or maybe that there's death scenes going on or, or something that's happening, you know, that, uh, that ups the stakes, shows that it's real. This is, uh, they're in a terrible situation and maybe they're not going to get out of it. Yeah, I, I, I like that one because sometimes I get quite attached to kind of like main characters. And, you know, it's, I think it's, you know, side sort of characters, you know, they, that can, they can serve that purpose alone, can't they, just to mm -hmm. drive home the the mortality of the rest of the the characters everyone else that's in there yeah and especially if you've built them well you know that they're a likable character that uh, people are connected to them and that they don't see it coming so um if it works use it so um and then we get to the fifth and final stage and this is a miraculous escape uh the monster is killed and through the through all the training and everything that's happened um and the ingenuity of the hero it's definitely the hero has stepped up and done the final. Um, what a letdown would it be if you're watching, spoiler alert, if you're watching <laughs> uh, uh, Return of the Jedi and Luke Skywalker is facing off against Darth Vader and then all of a sudden Ghost Ben comes jumping out and beats him. You know, like what <laughs> frag stealing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like what would the point be that we've invested all this time with Luke and having him become the, the, the Jedi and all of this. So that's it's important that your protagonist is the one who overcomes in the end you know that it's not through magic it's not through something else it's through their own will and ability um it's not god in the machine opening up and solving the problem you know it's this is what's happening you know that they were able to overcome this <laughs> i just thought that it would be like if uh, if ron had killed voldemort <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> like all of a sudden, Harry gets knocked down, and Ron just blasts him right in the back. <laughs> Harry would just throw his wand down and storm uh -huh. off. Storm <laughs> off. <laughs> throw it another tantrum. <laughs> yep, more teen angst. <laughs> because that's it. Because you know, you you followed his journey through all these books, and then it's him that you want to see. You know, even if the yeah. others have become a bit more interesting as characters, <laughs> right. you still want to see that one that you've connected with uh, succeed. Yeah, exactly, and it's it's really cool. Um, I talk about uh, I've talked about this before in uh, in Punch Them in the Gut, my uh, uh, class that I have on Udemy. Um, the idea, you know, that you're delivering a promise to the reader. You know that uh, you've made a promise all this way up to it. You know that this is what's going to happen. The protagonist is going to overcome. Um, and if you don't deliver on that promise, sometimes you can feel like you're, you've been cheated. Um, I think I may have mentioned this before, uh, the, um, gone girl plot and, um, that it's, it looks like it's going to be a revenge plot and today's revenge plots, um, in, you know, in film today, the person who is taking revenge, gets away happily ever after that really follows this, you know, that they, they get what they want. Now the old Greek revenge plot ends up with the person who's taking revenge, losing everything and everything falling apart at the end. And gone girl follows the old revenge plot, not the new one. And this is what we're talking about. Like, um, delivering promises, understanding, like, so when I walked into that book and was reading, I was like, I'm in a revenge plot. I understand revenge plots today to be this way. When it didn't deliver it at the end, when the, when the protagonist didn't come out um, on top at the end, I felt a little cheated until I understood that she was working in a different plot. But that's what we're talking about. You know, that these connections that can be made. So you understand, yes, I am running a uh, overcoming the monster is my main plot. I need to follow these elements so when the reader gets to the end of it, they don't feel like I didn't deliver the promise. Yeah, and that that could be a, a really interesting question to add on. Um, I know we did a, a show on beta readers recently. Um, to add on to that sort of um, mini questionnaire kind of thing for beta yeah. readers, you know, what 
what plot you know do you think that this is you know and like so you so that you know what expectations that the reader is is forming uh, mm -hmm. of of the story um yeah cuz like you say you know you could think that you're writing one kind of story um but cuz you've sort of maybe twisted it in a slightly different way it could come across a completely different way to the reader so i think it might be difficult for us to see that but and i think ad, ad, asking a beta reader is um you know one That's way to to find that out that's a really good idea because yeah, you want to make sure that um, that you're going to be marketing the book the right way, that you're going to be finding the right readers for this, and that they're going to understand what they're getting into. Um, if you look at uh, at at publishing companies um, that are in the romance genres, like um, oh, what the Harlequin romance is one of the big ones here in the U.S. They do so many books that they require their writers to follow exact formulas like this because they're putting out so many books that their readers are reading every single month they expect things to be a certain way even down um and this is for a printing side they uh they have uh covers you know that they've already purchased in advance you know that fit a certain number of word count that has to be in the book <laughs> so um but the thing the point i'm making here is that there are groups of readers who expect very certain things and if you are telling them that that's what this is and then it isn't, then you're really, you're going to lose them and they're not going to be your advocates in sharing your work. Mm. <laughs> Just started imagining then like if a, you know, like a, a romance novel kind of turned into like an overcoming the monster at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like. That might be quite annoying to the uh, to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that what those, uh, those, those uh, new Jane Austen, or what? What are they? The uh, and something something in zombies. I don't know. Pride and Prejudice and zombies and different things like that. <laughs> oh, so it's already been done. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> <laughs> it may have. It may not have. I don't know. So it may have just been a, a zombie love story. So, which we don't have enough of in the world. <laughs> no, you know they feel love too. They do. They do, and they need it. So, <laughs> National Hugger Zombie Day. <laughs> Did uh, oh so I, I mentioned it in my uh, my daily podcast this morning, but uh, I had a a random hug last night. We was talking about hugs. I'm walking out from the bar, and some guy had had a birthday party going on, and he was out having a smoke. And so I just I don't know him really. But I just said, hey, you know, happy birthday. I put my hand out to you could shake it, and all of a sudden he gives me this giant hug. He's like, thanks so much, <laughs> and and on the way. So you know, he, made his day. <laughs> yep, exactly. So, <laughs> but um. He yeah, wasn't so, out celebrating his birthday alone, was he? I, you know, I don't think so. Like, I mean, he had they they made him a cake and everything. So I don't know if he's just a real local or a real regular at the pub there, um, and they're all just celebrating together. But he knows everybody in there, so it was pretty cool <laughs> watching him. Everyone needs a hug sometimes. Yeah, they do. You know, everybody does. <laughs> so um, let's see. I think so. We've covered all the five parts here. There's um, I've mentioned a few different stories, you know, definitely check out for movies, check out Star Wars, Brotherhood of the Wolf, um, uh, Lord of the Rings, although I've ruined most of those for you today. <laughs> <laughs> um, all the classics. <laughs> I know, all the classics. Uh, books, check out uh, Dracula um, would be an excellent one to really show you a, a, a monster, overcoming the monster for old literature. And then for new one in September, check out Hank Hudson book too, because that'll definitely help you out. <laughs> So what uh, what about for you? What uh, you have any that you'd suggest taking a look at? I think some some of the older ones, like as you say, you know, like um, Dracula and Frankenstein, and I, I think they're really good boiled down, you know, to to just see the kind of like undiluted structure of this. You know, yes. I think it, it's great. There are a lot of modern twists on it now and things like that, but I think you know going and reading sort of like Bram Stoker's Dracula and you know like that that lets you just see like the bones of this of this plot mm -hmm. um, I think that's a good place to start yeah excellent excellent so well I think this was a great show today and um, this is a lot of fun I'm excited to to cover the next six of these plots yeah. it's going to be good to sort of see how how different some of them are and, and where they cross over you know and uh, I think you know it's a vital piece in in looking at in writing your own work in looking back over it and as you say in marketing it which you know in self publishing that's 
that's pretty important. <laughs> so you want to be targeting the right audience. Yeah, it is. Well, and it's also important, even if you're pitching the book to, uh, um, to publishers, you know, you don't want to be wasting your time pitching the book to the wrong place. You know, the ones who don't handle that, you think it's one way, but they get it and they're like, this isn't what we do. So, yeah. <laughs> so no zombies to the uh, to harlequin <laughs> yeah exactly they're like we don't do zombies not anymore not since the 70s <laughs> so well hey if you do enjoy the show listeners uh, please leave us a review on itunes a like on youtube or a plus on google and if you're an editor who'd like to be a guest on the show drop by the book show.com and drop us a note i'm clark chamberlain and for my co-host peter turley keep writing keep learning and build a better book